growing up gay, I think getting that sense of inequality and prejudice and then a passion for, yeah, the world doesn't have to be as it is, whether we're looking at the poverty that some people are experiencing and are particularly experiencing now, whether you look at racism and the structural racism, the transphobia, yeah, the stigma associated with mental health, it doesn't have to be like this. It's in our power to make the world better. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Burnt Chef Journal, a hospitality-specific podcast dedicated to challenging mental health stigma and conversations designed to inspire a new, healthier, happier and more sustainable hospitality profession. This week's guest is one that I've been looking forward to for quite some time, actually, I'm joined by Simon Blake, who is the Chief Executive Officer for Mental Health First Aid England. He's been in this position as CEO for about four and a half years at Mental Health First Aid England, and I was very fortunate to share a panel discussion with him close to a year ago. We've remained in contact ever since then. He is an incredibly passionate and experienced individual who is doing fantastic and making fantastic changes when it comes down to the subject of mental health and well-being and our conversations around it. So I was very, very excited when he agreed to sit down and have an interview and a conversation on the Burnt Chef Journal. This is a slightly longer than normal episode. It will be about an hour and 10, an hour and 15 minutes. So you may want to break this up, but everything that we've discussed is all relevant, very topical and current. And so I would encourage you to listen to the conversation and if you've got any feedback feel free to send it our way but without further ado let's start this week's episode the burnt chef project is proudly sponsored by lamb western a leading provider of innovative high quality potato products created for chefs to help operators thrive both today and tomorrow working carefully with sustainably minded farmers and growers Lamb Weston provides potato solutions for every type of kitchen, from premium British chips and fries to potato shapes, wedges and mash. To find out more, head to lambweston.eu or search your partner in potatoes. This week I am joined by Simon Blake, OBE, who is an incredible human being I've had the fortune of talking virtually with. We were going to do this podcast in sunny Bournemouth, weren't we? We were, we were. I can't remember what happened, but now it, it would be snowy Bournemouth anyway, windy Bournemouth now, wouldn't it? Would, wouldn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, whereabouts in the world are you currently in, in London? I'm in London, yeah. Sun's shining in uh, sleepy Somerset at this moment in time, so we might have had a good day after all. I'll come in summer. I'll come in summer, Chris. We'll do part two. Yeah, with regards to the conversation we've just had about diaries and diary management, I'm going to block a couple of weeks out in the summer. And there's not going to be 15 meetings in the week. There's not going to be lots of traveling. So there'll be adequate time to go down. And one of our non-execs owns a couple of restaurants down there as well. So there'll be opportunity to try some interesting food. Perfect. I look forward to it. Good. So, I mean, (laughs) I don't usually like to plan my meetings, but you're an incredible guest. And I went to go, I jumped onto your LinkedIn profile to have a look at some of your history to be able to specifically ask certain questions. But you have done so much incredible work in, I mean, just the last few years alone. I just don't know where to begin. So I think first and foremost, what was your first entrance into the not-for-profit sector and the charitable sector? And what is it that drives your... I was going to say sacrifice, but it's not sacrifice. Your willingness to help and to support other people. It's definitely not a sacrifice. So complete accident, Chris. I mean, I'm supposed to be an educational psychologist by now, but I took a year out and went off following love and it all went wrong. And I ended up back in a pub in Cardiff and then running a sex education project. But there is a little bit before that, which is when I was at school, we had what was known as the special unit then for children with Down syndrome. And when I came to do my work experience, I went back to the primary school where that special unit was. And I then helped out in the play scheme when I was in my, I guess, 15, 16 
17, no, 15, 16 summer. So before I started working you know, and earning money. So I volunteered into the play scheme, which was for what's now Action for Children. And then everything else is an accident, you know, realistically. I went to university. So I grew up, you know, gay man in the 80s, university at the end of the 80s. We set up was the HIV education project at university. And I then literally took a gap year and went to work in America, got a sex education project working with young men, became an expert by default because no one else was doing it, and then did 21 years in sexual health and health education for young people. I love it. And what was it about that specific, maybe not necessarily the subject, but the work in itself? What was it that kept you doing that for such a long period of time? What was it about that? So I think at all of this, I guess at the heart of it, we all muddle through, don't we? And we all muddle through the best we can with the opportunities, the circumstances, the blows and the highs that we get. And so I guess if you were to track through yeah, I wanted to be an educational psychologist. My interest has always been in human beings. And then, you know, growing up gay, I think getting that sense of inequality and prejudice and then a passion for, yeah, the world doesn't have to be as it is, whether we're looking at the poverty that some people are experiencing and are particularly experiencing now, whether you look at racism and the structural racism, the transphobia, yeah, the stigma associated with mental health. It doesn't have to be like this. It's in our power to make the world better. And I will believe that until my dying day, you know, I think is is really where all of this sort of sits. And I can feel the fire in my belly as I'm saying it. And it's thank you for asking the question because sometimes it is also a job, you know, and, and you get up and you you know, and sometimes you're tired and sometimes, you know, there will be difficult things that you've got to deal with or most of the time there will be difficult things that you've got to deal with. But ultimately, you know, this is about, you know, successes of the world being a bit better. You know, I guess if I can retire or die, actually there's a little bit better because of something that you did, then I'll be happy with that. A noble cause I strongly um, agree with, I think, that, it leads me on to the next question, actually, rather than me talking. What is it that you think, was there any particular moment in your life that you think really had that profound impact on dedicating yourself to that cause in terms of leaving the world in a better place than you found it? I mean, I know you've mentioned things like discrimination for sex and race and various other bits and bobs, but was there anything that you can think of that clearly defines it other than having an interest in psychology that, that's driven that? Gosh, I think I started needing a bit more money. Yeah, was the honest is the honest answer. I was working in a pub called the Green Parrot, and and I was applying literally for any job because I you know I graduated. I was supposed to have yeah you know, this amazing job, but what I'd done was you know wasted the tiny last bit of my overdraft. You know, gone overseas, been dumped and then come back. And I was literally looking for any other job. And I think what I learned, you know, the passion has grown as I've learned more. You know, I didn't really, I've probably lived my life making a number of naive decisions or stumbling into things because I haven't known better. And that certainly, you know, my understanding around inequality has grown. I remember getting to university and somebody saying that their parents were giving them £80 a week. And I was thinking, I think that's more than my mum earns a month. Um, and yeah, and I remember, you know, arriving and thinking, oh, I had an A, B and C and realizing that most other people had three A's or four A's in their A levels. Yeah, there were all these sorts of things, which I just, I've learned as, as I've gone through and I've had enormous privilege as well as, but each time you hear and you learn things. So I don't think there's ever been an epiphany, but I think there has, my sense of fairness. If my mum was still alive, she would tell you that I was one of those children that would just say, that's not fair. And it wouldn't be things that are happening to me. It would be when I would see something happening you know, in the street that I didn't like. That I think I probably always had that acute sense of fairness 
and can remember being at what would be class three or something else, seven or eight, and doing a play about bullying in the playtime, which I coordinated and probably coerced people, you know, to do. And Mrs. Parsons saying, come on, you've got to perform that in front. So there was always that sort of sense. So it was probably... Yeah, I'm, I'm sounding slightly virtuous here, but I think it just was there. And money has never been a huge motivator. You know, I earn a nice wage now and I have nice things and all that. But if you were to say to me, do you want the world to be a better place or do you want to earn a huge amount of money? I would go for the world being a better place all the time as long as, as, long as I wasn't destitute, I guess. As long as I, as long as I had it, had, had <laughs> this is all in danger of going horribly pear shaped here because you start trying to quantify that and I'm not sure where you would quantify it. But you know what I mean. Yeah, it's that awkward uncomfortableness when we're talking about actually having a life that's comfortable. And, and when it comes down to monetary, there's still such a, a stigma attached to uh, discussing financial matters, which I get, I get, I do understand that. But I think it's all relative. And like with most things in life, it doesn't matter what other people believe, it's what you believe. And I think that's what's Sorry, let me rephrase that. It does matter what other people believe. It's not about other people's opinions of yourself. It's about what your opinion of yourself is. I just find it interesting because from, you know, both of us are on journeys at this moment in time to improve the topic of conversation of mental health and to reduce mental illness within today's society and various factions. And I think that from my background, I'm trying to think of similarities. And I remember my mum, although she used to run busy pubs, she always was during the day she had nursing and like care roles. So she used to run a youth club and then physically handicapped and able bodied club and she used to work in nursing homes. And I remember this period of my life where actually I suppressed a lot of that and just went, Money. Money's the driver. Like protect yourself, don't care for other people, put your blinkers on and just go for it and earn money. And then the reason why I asked the question, the reason why that propelled the question was that it wasn't until having experienced my own, you know, trials with mental illness that I suddenly went, actually, none of that's making me happy. And that I need to go back to that authentic character, which is help people before you start trying to rid the world of problems by just earning lots of money, because that doesn't often work. And, and I think the interesting bit there, Chris, is I guess the power of humans to write ourselves. You know, we learn, don't we? We have experiences. Some of them will be good, and some of them might not be as good at the time, but we often take something from it. So those moments, you know, I'm not sure I believe in everything's predetermined, but I do believe that, yeah, that there are moments in life where where things change, where things happen and, and suddenly there'll be. And I guess if you were to go back to the one bit which I guess has been consistent throughout my life is I have always firmly believed that secrets and stigma unhelpful and I can remember believing that from you know from a very early age where you know, I remember you know some being ashamed of something and it be you know, religious based and just thinking this this is just nonsense and I don't know if I I mean I'm putting adult words to what were feelings at the time but I remember it being visceral and if there's anything that we know it's that stigma secrets wherever they are tend to cause harm so yeah, it almost doesn't matter how or where we get here. I just hope that more and more of us will start doing that because it releases ourselves and other people when yeah, a stigma serves no purpose in <laughs> that's of any benefit in any way, shape or form. No, I agree. I agree. It's difficult to explain to people though about just live authentically. Like don't live with any predetermined agenda of what you perceive, you know, the world needs or how you should be but live how you feel and I can't remember we've spoken so much in detail about various bits and bobs just through general catch-ups but like gut instinct plays a massive massive part in and trying to I'd love if we could like invent a little red pill that you can give to people and say take this pill and you'll be able to connect with your gut instinct because so many of us squash it and we push it down but actually if you start to listen to your gut even when it's completely 100% wrong the fallout from that error or that mistake or whatever it might be is never as severe as it would be if you went led with your head, right? And I guess 
to go right back to you know, the whole issue around mental health, one of the things that I've learned, you know, I've only really worked in the mental health sector, although there's always been a, a mental health element to it, but only worked in the mental health sector at MHFA England for four and a half years. What I've learned is that by not listening to your mind or your gut, that you actually ignore two of the most powerful things that are there yeah we don't you know our body and mind are so closely interrelated and yet we often ignore our guts and we often ignore the signals from our brain whether that whether things are right or wrong as well yeah there's a japanese term and it's sitting in my head currently i cannot remember it is it japanese term for it's for peace or for well-being here i am rather um professionally googling it whilst on that's very professional. <laughs> Ikigai, which is acknowledging that mental well-being is recognized as just as important as anything else. And it's the Japanese ideology of finding joy in the purpose of your life, no matter what that might be. It's absolutely fascinating. How do you spell it? It is spelt I-K-I-G-A-I. And I was looking at this the other day, and it just it's just something about it resonates me and the way it's portrayed or the way it's described or just visually there's like a series of circles that all interlink but it's about sort of your four key areas of your passion mission vocation and profession and they all link so it's what you love what the world needs what you can be paid for and what you are good at and if you can get all of those to balance you've got this wholesome well-being sphere that that actually is is beneficial and conducive to health Amazing. And that's why when people talk about work-life balance, it's not quite right. It's the balanced life which work fits into, isn't it? Which this captures so beautifully is that everything has to be in balance in order for us to genuinely live. I'm not the biggest fan of the phrase, your best life. But on this occasion, I think it is probably the right thing to say that if you can get all of those things in balance, then you're going to have that best life. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. I agree. So let's bring it on to. I mean, you've held some, you've held CEO positions in quite a lot of different organisations, which I think is a whole podcast on itself, but more focused around leadership and other elements. And perhaps you and I, when we meet up and have have some lunch, I think that'd be a fantastic one to put your brains on. But in terms of your role as at Mental Health First Aid England, which I think is is obviously your current role and. Where do I begin? How did that position come about first and foremost? Because before you were at Headspace? No, I was at National Union of Students immediately before. So I've been provided, I've been advised into Headspace, but that's more recent than this. So Mental Health First Aid England has been around for 15 years and was a government programme initially. And I'd actually be, I was on holiday and the headhunters the recruitment agency phoned and said, there's a brilliant role, social enterprise, mental health first aid England, what do you think? And I was like, I'm on holiday and I don't want to think, <laughs> but this sounds really interesting. Can you tell me a little bit more? And they did. So I think the reason, so when I was at Brooke, which is the Young People's Sexual Health Charity beforehand, we did a lot of work, which was about making the links between young people's well-being and their sexual choices. So then when I was at the National Union of Students, we then we brought in mental health into the strategy for the National Union of Students, because, of course, mental health and well-being, of which financial well-being, you know, stress related to academic study, pressure transition, you know, is a really significant part. So even though I didn't have huge expertise in mental health, had some expertise and then experience, say, of of leading organisations. So, you know, I applied for the job and I remember having the first interview or your first meeting sat in the middle of Hyde Park in the summer and thinking, gosh, wouldn't it be amazing to have a job which was really focused about trying to improve you know, people's understanding around mental health and well-being. I guess, yeah, in between working at Brook, where I'd worked, then worked for sexual health for 20-odd years, I'd made a conscious decision to stop working in sexual health and had gone to NUS um, because of the connection around lots of the liberation 
work. But when I was then having that conversation about mental health, I was like, oh, these shoes fit. Yeah, and I, and I remember sitting thinking, this is where I should be, and then was lucky to get yeah the job. And I guess the bit in here is around social justice, isn't it? Mental health is a social justice issue. It's an inequalities issue. It is an issue where stigma exists and is on helpful and it is at the heart of our humanity and I really believe that there is so much opportunity for change that we've only just started scratching the surface you know that people doing amazing amazing work that you're doing the work that mind has done over in all years and the work that people with their own lived experiences have done the training that's gone on there is so much but we've only just started you know really yeah, if we start thinking about self-care, if we start thinking about the working weeks, all the stuff around the four-day working week, you know, the impact of mobile phones on the, the neuropsychology, on the neuroscience of the brain, and you know, being able to all of there's just so much that we just need to understand and to be able to create change. It's amazing. If you were to refer to our journey. I don't like using the term journey. It sounds very cliche, doesn't it? But if we let's talk about the subject of mental health and well-being, if we were to refer to this as a stage of the human growth. So, for example, you know, when the wheel was invented, that's when we were in our toddler phase. You know, where are we currently with the conversations around mental health and our understanding of it? I personally think that we are very much at the early stages of it. You know, I often say you know, a very young child will say that they've got an arm and they will point to anywhere from their fingertip through to you know, their shoulder blade and it's their arm. And of course, there are some people, you know, who are, you know, streets ahead of that. But if we were to think of ourselves around mental health literacy as a nation, I think we're at the stage of we've got an arm. And in a way, COVID accelerated some of that because we were all a bit more willing to talk about well-being to recognize that it had an impact on how we felt and on how we were able to behave but I think where we are left with now is when you say mental health you might be talking about mental illness you might be talking about something to do with promoting wellness or you might be talking about something else completely And there is the danger that everything from you've said something which I don't like through to, yeah, I've got a serious enduring mental illness can be described using the same words without people knowing that they're talking about very, very different things. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would say that I was thinking this morning, the shower is my thinking place. I don't know why. Perhaps it's because I'm without any distractions of a phone. I was thinking this morning how amazing it has been in the last, let's say the last four or five years, that actually this has become a topic of conversation that finally gets the acknowledgement that it deserves. But there's been such a rapid growth and exploration of this particular area that we are still very, very, very early on we're a couple of hundred billion years ago in the life cycle of evolution of earth that it's where do we go next and and i know that we've spoken about this but we've got that general awareness and still that misinterpretation of even the basic concept of mental health and it's one of the challenges i like to do if i'm speaking to a crowd or if i'm speaking to a, a training session i'll always say right quick show of hands who in the room has mental health and you always get one or two people look to their left and look to their right and one person will put their hand up and pull it back down again and you can see stigma and uh, lack of understanding at play at that moment in time but where do we go i mean awareness is still growing conversations especially with gen z's and millennials are becoming more increasingly common where they acknowledge that they have mental health and mental illness may be part of something that, that's going on with them currently but what are the next stages i think it's Be comfortable taking one step at a time. Be persistent and keeping the conversations going and being specific when we're talking. So, yeah, right now, 
rather than assuming, I guess, that somebody might understand, which is you know, recognizing that we all have a brain, we therefore all have mental health, that mental health is part of our overall health, that if you were to say to me, you know, how's your physical health, my starting point wouldn't be where people often start in relation to mental health and accept how much and how little we know. I think there's another piece for me, which is some really simple concepts which can help us to understand what's going on. And for me, the classic ones of those would be you know, what we described at MHF in England as your stress container. Yeah, we all know that moment where we've dealt with all sorts of things and suddenly you stub your toe and that's the thing that you lose lose your temper about or start crying or whatever it is because we don't understand the cumulative impact yeah, around it, that we, yeah, we've changed from people who didn't have mobile phones and weren't attached to everything all the time to people who mostly have mobile phones and are attached to everything all the time and what impact that has on our brain and therefore our ability to manage and handle things and I think you know I have my laptop in my computer in my kitchen Um, I deliberately put it away in the cupboard at the end of the day so it's not the last thing that I see as I go to get a glass of water in order to go to bed because I've learned that my brain associates that computer with work and might get my brain thinking I try desperately to not have my phone in the bedroom because I know that that will mean that I'll look at my phone as I'm trying to go to sleep and I might see the wrong thing on my phone which means that well a just having it is likely to keep me awake but if I see something which upsets enrages you know worries that also impacts on sleep so I think there's all of those things which we can learn which are quite basic drinking enough water the importance of movement you know the importance of sleep thinking about our digital habits. If you were to run a marathon today, you would probably think about checking your feet were all right and giving them a rest this evening. When we do, you know, every day our brain does a marathon at work. We don't necessarily check in and think about giving it a rest. We, you know, we'll just ignore often what it's telling us and and then start trying to do other things. So one of my strengths is I simplify things. Sometimes people say I oversimplify things, but I do think that there are, We don't have to be neuroscientists here. We don't have to be psychologists or psychiatrists. We just have to learn some basics about how our brains work in order to understand, you know, what's going on. If it's 10 o'clock at night and I can barely write a sentence, it's not because the sentence is difficult. It's because I'm exhausted. You know, and so at that point, get down, go to sleep. The next morning, the sentence comes. You know, it's not rocket science. (laughs) And yet sometimes we ignore all of those sorts of things. Yeah. There's a big part of education and it's certainly getting better at school level. I know firsthand that I'm consulting with our local primary school about well-being initiatives and how to introduce mindfulness techniques and various other schemes to help educate and improve awareness around the subject matter. But when we were at school, we never had that. If your brain's fuzzy for a bit, you should probably take a rest, drink some water and get plenty of rest. We just... A, it wasn't spoken about, and B, if it was, it was just like, well, that's your problem, not anyone else's. So you are stigmatised with that, right? It's interesting, isn't it? I guess there's a whole combination of things. So my gran would have said eight hours sleep, eight hours play, eight hours work. So, yeah, it wouldn't stack up in a textbook, but pretty good you know, rules for life, given yeah, there definitely wasn't mobile phone. And I don't think there was a, a TV yeah, sort of in there. My... Mum would have said similar, but she'd have been that make sure you're out of the house for at least three hours a day getting sunlight, you know, on, on your face. Yeah. So I think there probably is more wisdom than there was, but there are like everything in, in life, when on a day by day basis it changes so slowly that we don't notice. But when yeah, I'm fifty next year, and when I look to what life was like as a fourteen year old just in terms of day-to-day concepts, not, you know, accounting for the fact that you're you know, working and all those sorts of things, but just, you know, I didn't have a mobile phone until I was 25, you know, didn't really have more than three or four channels, whatever it was, you know, there were all sorts of things which were just quite different. I think we don't necessarily bring the wisdom of our older generations with us. 
yeah, I guess is the only thing that I would say. You know, that sort of stuff around breathing, resting, you know, all of those sorts of things. I think my parents and you know, grandparents said those things. They just didn't think about them as mental health. So I think there's difference in mental illness and stigma and all sorts of things. But I do think some of those core cool things about wellness and and balance, there probably was some greater sense of them. Perhaps we've we've kept with us as life has changed so much. Yeah, and certainly more knowledge around mental hygiene and that mental fitness element, which is, you know, often enough and when, when when I'm talking, we tend to say to them, like, how often do you brush your teeth? And everyone goes, yeah, twice a day, because if I don't do that, my teeth go rotten and they fall out and you go, okay, cool. When was the last time you had any physical fitness? Oh, you know, once a week. Okay, nah, all right, that's fine. That might work for you. What about mental fitness? And they're like, huh? Come again? Like, what does that look like? What are you talking about? This this is a foreign concept, and it's how we encourage and educate around that element. But with potential changes to law, this might mean that we can start to educate a little bit better. So I saw the news article fairly recently uh, that mental health birthday training should be a legal prerequisite within organizations to help improve the education and perhaps support mechanisms when it comes to mental health in the corporate world how far along is this and and what's that looking like pragmatically if you're enjoying this week's episode consider heading over to our website and supporting our ongoing work in destigmatizing mental illness and creating a healthier happier and more sustainable industry by purchasing some of our branded merchandise we have a whole range of t-shirts hoodies chef's jackets well-being journals plus a whole host more available on Worldwide Dispatch. All funds raised from sales of these items go towards free-to-access e-learning content, as well as providing free support systems and help for those who may be experiencing difficulty with their mental health. So specifically, an MP called Dean Russell took a private member's bill, which was around changing the first aid regulations around mental health to ensure that mental health first aid was part of employers' responsibilities. Private members' bills tend, without getting techie about it, they don't start with government and therefore they tend not to proceed. That's not to say they never do. There are examples of where they where they do. I think whether it does or whether it doesn't, the really important bit about this is that mental health, as you will know and advocate through all of your work is has to be a strategic issue it has to be across an organization there isn't a silver bullet it's in job design it's in the way that people's work is organized it's in the conversations that managers have it's in the way that people are treated whether they feel safe at work whether they feel seen valued heard all of those sorts of things and so really really key that we continue thinking about whole organization approaches mental health literacy for individuals for organizations psychological safety and mental health training for line managers mental health first aid training let's say you've got first aiders or champions or whatever it is the core bit of all of this that i think is so important chris and you and i have spoken about this before is Work, when it is designed well, is good for us. You know, it gives us purpose. It gives passion. You know, going right back to the conversation at the beginning, which is, you know, what is the fire in your belly? And, you know, getting up, you know, the structure, you know, cleaning your teeth, you know, all of those sorts of things, getting out, feeling the earth under your feet, looking around, noticing stuff that's there. It's all, it's not just what you do in the working day. It's that whole piece that work does for you. So for me, yeah, I'd love to see yeah, organizations have a legal responsibility around positively promoting mental health alongside, yeah, as part of the equalities functions, as part of um, yeah, their commitment to people as well as the health and safety and first aid piece. And at the moment, mental health Poor mental health, mental ill health cost UK businesses £56 billion per year. So, you know, for every pound invested 
there's a return of five pound thirty. So the moral case is really clear that you know we need to be looking after people that work with us. The economic case, you know, is really clear. There's a five pound thirty return on every pound that you invest in mental health, and that's in addition to all of those other things which you need to be thinking about, like the impact of sexism and racism and homophobia in workplaces, which all impact on well-being in the workplace. So you've got to think about this in big picture sort of approach and think about from a job design, job evaluation, right the way through to how do you support people who are unwell at work to stay in work? How do you make sure that everybody has the opportunity to thrive? Yeah, there's a lot. I think that's where it comes from a corporate and a commercial level. I think that's where perhaps it highlights how young we are in this journey because often when you're called in for, and we work with some fantastic partners who are really, really on board with a whole systems change approach, but we do also from time to time get inquiries from people who go, I need mental health first aiders in my business. Why? Because people are unwell and we need to help them. And you go, okay. Who's supporting your mental health first aiders? I hadn't thought about that. Okay, what pragmatic steps are you going to do to reduce chronic stress and ill health within your organization? Well, that's what the mental health first aiders are for. You're like, no, move past. Yes, it's a step. It's an important step. But move past that, you know, waiting for people to get into crisis to be able to provide someone that they can talk to and start looking at how you reduce the instances of crisis and and the, those Deloitte figures that you're talking about one of the really interesting things for me was the pre-screening element you know if you're able to provide pre-screening there's a, the return on investment I always find that the return on investment is so crude but that is the reality of the area that we live in is that someone has to pay for this and it's usually the businesses and they want to see an ROI but that return on investment was it 6.3 6.5 return on investment for pre-screening which allows people to be able to establish or at least to find out if they are experiencing mental anguish or illness before it becomes critical. It's those sort of things. But we struggle commercially to get that over the line because people just can't see the immediate ROI on that. They can see the figures, but they don't necessarily understand how long it's going to take to reach that. It's, uh, yeah. I think this goes to your bit about sophistication, though, isn't it? And for me, it's really important to recognise that everybody is in a different starting place and sometimes something that is so obvious to somebody is not obvious to somebody else and whether it's mental health first aiders whether it's a you know a two-hour presentation yeah for me the key bit is let's get this conversation started And let's recognise that we'll always be taking two steps forward and one step back. And also to really, I think we're using workplaces as a place for people to, A, we want work to change and to be supportive of and nourishing people's mental health and well-being. You know, that good work designed well being good for you but it's also a place where what we learn we can take into communities and into our families and into the rest of our lives as well because so many adults you know are working so I guess I feel fairly pragmatic about this and I really believe that there is no magic solution you know sometimes you've got the best of programs but people don't trust that it's not connected to HR and sometimes people have got you know the least money and the least opportunity to invest but they know that they'll be really listened to so it's how do we make sure that this is both as simple and complicated as it needs to be and that the commitment is as strong yeah and as persistent as it needs to be because for me the worry I have is that we're not finding the absolute solution. So people go, well, maybe there isn't an answer. And actually, there are lots of steps that we can 
take and we can make and we can fail and we can't always measure it. So I was um, doing something today where someone said, do we over rely on an employee assistance program as a country, as organisations? And I think my view is it should just be there and everybody should know about it. And we shouldn't be talking about whether it's, no, they will help some people, but they will never be enough in of themselves. But just because they're not enough in and of themselves doesn't mean that we should be questioning whether they add value at all. And so for me, I think that's the challenge that we've got here, isn't it? That it's so many things. And we know that this is about culture, it's about people, it's about protocols, it's about systems. And ultimately, it's really about that ongoing process of learning and and developing. And we know that companies do get it right. We know that companies you know, can really drive engagement and we know that people can still get on well within those companies. And it's how do we learn and connect as we go through? I guess I sometimes worry that we, in search of perfection, or in search of the perfect answer or the simple answer, when we're talking about humans here, so there will neither be a perfect or a simple answer. It's going to be a whole multitude of things and none of it is going to suit everybody all of the time. But thinking about equity, understanding that well-being and performance fuel one another, they're not in conflict with one another, recognising that line managers play a really, really absolutely critical role and function and you know, the starting point has to be that we feel and are you know, psychologically safe yeah, at work. Which is something that the um, new ISO, global ISO standards, should hopefully help with uh, 45,003? Something like that. <laughs> like it becomes very, date like again, something that's based around psychological safety is so clinical, again, with its numbering. But it's about actually having that ability and that that gold sort of not even gold standard just that standard i mean there's things like what really does i don't know what i find sometimes difficult is obviously we partner with hsc a health and safety executive in the uk and you know there's a fantastic example of a legal requirement within workplaces to start tackling and reducing the rates of workplace stress, which attributes, is it half, over half of all working days lost or a direct result of stress? And I think Deloitte said that 40% of all turnover is directly linked to mental illness. And they have a fantastic tool, which is designed to allow you to identify, to address, and to respond to the workplace when it comes down to workplace stress. And yet, and this is an arbitrary number, but I think it would be safe to say in two and a half, three years of us training out in businesses, we've seen one organization, 99%, 99.5% of organizations don't have a workplace stress risk assessment in place, even though it's a legal requirement. And it's things like that when I think when you're looking at ISO standards and looking at legal requirements for mental health training, I'm just like, these have such profound benefits. They, they don't cost anything either. You know, something like a workplace stress risk assessment is just about having a conversation with your team. I wonder what we need to do in order to get people engaged with that. I think it's the persistence. I honestly think it's the persistence. It's the conversation. It's one conversation at a time. And, and statute and regulation yeah, will make differences. But ultimately, this is about hearts and minds because it is, can't be about checkboxes. Yeah, that's the, the bit which it can't be about. And so, yeah, great tool, the risk assessment tool. We need people to believe that they need to use it. We need people to, to understand what it is that's being asked of them because, yeah, the, the other bit is again, even with the word stress, you know, what, Think about our language, the way that we use language. And yes, you know, oh, that was really stressful. And I sometimes hear myself say, and I'm like, was it really stressful? No, it wasn't really stressful. It was just, yeah. And, I, oh, just, yeah, and we'll just try to <laughs> reuse the language you know, into better bits. So we use lots of language, which again, doesn't necessarily help us to really understand sometimes what we're doing. Yeah. 
I had that conversation at an event recently. It was a conversation on workplace well-being and mental health. And every single time there's mental health in the title when it comes down to a panel discussion or to a conversation, you'd be lucky to get 50% attendance. I think you have to use it because otherwise you risk stigmatizing it further by not using the term mental health or workplace well-being. But almost find like perhaps we've gone too far in the other direction where people are actually starting to zone out with regards to that. And you, you feel like you're having to try our new 90 day, you know, mental fitness challenge or whatever it might be just to jazz it up to try and get rebuy or get people's buy-in back again. Do you ever feel that perhaps we've gone, we've gone too far or that we need to sort of take a step back with regards to it a little bit? I don't think we can never say we've gone too far because there are people that are still, there are so much that needs to be done within the workplace. I think what, I do believe is that we continually have to make sure that we understand what it is that we're doing, that everybody remains committed to what we're doing, that it's seen as being good and important practice, that it is just what we do to support people's mental health. Every time you have a performance conversation, it's a well-being conversation. Every time you're having a well-being conversation, it's a performance conversation. They are literally the same things and you know managers play an absolutely critical role in helping people you know in work compassionate leadership you know is absolutely core to mental health and well-being employee engagement so I think there is perhaps a bit of what is it we're doing why are we doing it how are we doing it do all these things add together which KPIs is it contributing to how is it helping performance and sometimes If people understand those things, then they'll find their way forward. But I'm not always sure that we're absolutely clear about that. So it feels as though it's something additional. It feels as though it's a new thing to do on top of the thing. Or is there a badge to get here rather than this is just core business that we've got to get better at, continue to get better at. It's part of our HR strategy. It's part of our business strategy. And it will contain a whole raft of different elements. Yeah, I agree. I agree. From Mental Health First Aid England's point of view, you you have just refreshed the Mental Health First Aid two-day course, which we've run out actually here at the Burn Chef Project. And the feedback with the hospitality community is, is good. Just been strong. What was it that, what sort of the main changes for anyone who's previously done mental health first aid perhaps two years ago? What sort of main changes have you implemented into that? And you know, is it worth for people going through that again as a, as a refresher? So I think there are a number of things. You know, obviously we've been running it for a long time. There were some key things which people wanted more skills practice. So really making sure that bringing the skills piece right up front was there and that that is practice that how do you have those conversations and understanding the different ways that you might enter as key. So there's more skills-based practice within it and a bit less information because some of that information you can read, you know, transfer. So very much focused around the skills. The other bit, which is absolutely key to it, is that there is also an app and a connection into the organization after so some webinars and and further learning one of the things that the bits of feedback we got was brilliant we've done the course and sometimes we go in and we start using the skills immediately but other times we don't sometimes we are the only person in an organization and sometimes there isn't support so trying to build that support for people both through information resources which they can access digitally but also through some online webinars and support and that's gone down incredibly well as well and we also wanted to make sure that we had a strong equity and inequality focus within it in terms of if somebody did it two years ago every three years there's a refresher program so if I had done it two years ago my suggestion would be to do the refresher access the support and benefits which brings through you know the new manual and new understanding and then to rather than doing the whole course again there's a system it's really sort of a three-year cycle and that will be important for people just to to stay connected with thank you and i think that people should they should definitely look at doing the refreshes fairly regularly it's an invaluable course i find i think it's again people are looking at it as a a complete 
fix. And I think that it should be, as you said earlier, play part of a persistent well-being strategy that allows people not necessarily to feel that it is going to solve everything. And that peer support network as well, I think is vital. Um, just out of curiosity, is that available to people who have already done the existing mental health first aid training or is it just the ones who have done the, the new training? The support benefits bit. Um, so I can send you a link if you can put in any notes that go out with this. But basically, it's accessible to people who've already done the course. It's just whether, you know, depending on the timestamp, um, whether you need to do the refresher, whether it's better to just access you know, the support and benefits you know, without doing the refresher. So if you did it to course seven months ago, you probably don't want to do the refresher now. But there is a one off route in which is available for people to do. If you're closer to the three years, then it would make sense to do the refresher. Now, I'll send you the link so that you can stick, if you'd be kind enough, stick it in the, you know, the information that's attached to this. Yeah, I'll be sure to do that because it's one of the big areas is that, you know, we might be able to train and to educate on how to engage and how to support someone who may be struggling. But it's like, understanding how to skydive or something like that you might know the, the the technical aspects of it but until you gain experience and confidence in that area it's still a relatively new green skill and so that support network i think will be invaluable for people to be able to to access these are about helping conversations and helping conversations are often as much about the question and the listening and the signposting rather than the knowing the answers and that's the bit which is unusual for some of us, isn't it, that we're asked a question and we're supposed to know the answer. So remembering that we don't need to know the answer, but we can help people to try to find the answer themselves or, or to signpost into other forms of support. I totally agree with that. I do an exercise when I've got a, a mixed group and I've got, sometimes we've got sort of men or women in a group and I use the examples of I say, if I was chatting to my wife, my wife comes home one day, she goes, I've got a really, really stressful day. And me, being a man, will turn around to her and say, well, it sounds really, really hard. But here's what I would do about that to fix that situation. And all the women in the room, as I'm telling this story, they go, oh, no, and they screw their faces up. And they go, that's not what you should do. And I think that there's a valuable lesson in that example, which is actually sometimes it's not about what you perceive the fix for that particular situation to be logically, but it's about actually being able to provide that space and, and that empathy to be able to go, yeah, that sounds awful. You know, it sounds hard. I get it. I think it's a bit mansplaining, Chris, don't they? When Man. somebody does do that. <laughs> I'm not very, I'm um, not very okay, but yes, I think I might be right. <laughs> But the, I think that is the important bit, isn't it? I felt that, or I done that, or I know that rather than just listening. And exactly as you say, that sounds really difficult. What would be helpful is yeah the bit, and that's where the skills are so important. The other bit, which I would just say about for me about mental health first aid interventions, is sometimes I'm like oh, afterwards, I think, oh, I just had a conversation, which probably three years ago I would have thought was an intervention but actually now is a conversation and so to our bit about where are we in the in the journeys of this yeah it's all how do we become a nation which is literate in having conversations which enable people you know to be able to express themselves and to help themselves and to access help when they need it and I I sometimes think we we talk about it's okay not to be okay, or it's okay to ask for help. There's something for me in the, in this, which is how do we flip this to, do you know what? Chris is going through a bit of a rough time at the moment. I'm going to take him dinner. I'm going to offer to pick up the kids. From, I'm going to tell him I'm going to pick the kids up from school. I'm not going to say, do you need any help? Because Chris might well say no, because you know, that's what we do. We say we're okay. Whereas if we just say, oh, actually, there's a lot going on at the moment. And I... I remember when mum was dying and I was caring for her. People, some people would phone and say, do you want any help? And I'd say, well, I don't think there's much you can do. You're 250 miles away. Don't say my, then politely, I'd say, no, thank you. In my head, I'd be thinking, whereas some mothers would say, no, there's a lot going on. We're just going to send a box of food. You know, what would you want in it? It wasn't a question about whether they were going to send the food or not. It was, what do you want in it? So that you could you know, check where mum was in terms of the eating habits and, and, 
you know, at other times the next door neighbor would just come in and say, you've been here for three days um, now, you need to get yourself out. I'm just going to sit here for an hour or so. Whereas if they come across and said, do you want me to sit for an hour ago? I probably would have said no. So, you know, it's all of that stuff about how do we learn to lean in to things? How do we learn to develop our empathy and understanding about different situations that people are going in so that we offer the help rather than wait for people to ask for help? Well, we probably need to do both. We need to learn to get better at asking for help, but also learning how to offer it and understand and be more empathic at the same time. Yeah, that proactive support. I agree that that, yeah, I agree with, for what it's worth, I agree that that's the right sort of thought process. But often, I don't know, I don't know how you find it, and I'm conscious of time, but I find that there's almost by a paralysis by analysis now, which is I don't want to say or do anything that's likely to make the situation worse. So it's better that I say nothing at all. And we, we see that with addressing mental illness within the workplace and how to effectively manage that, but also with conversations around diversity and inclusion as well. Often it's okay to be curious. And it's okay to ask questions or to be able to provide interventions if you're doing it from a place of integrity and curiosity. But I find that with a lot of conversation now, people go, oh, we, you know, I can't ask someone about that just because it might make them worse or it might offend them. And, and I find that we've sort of almost gone, the pendulum has swung Let's actually almost refer the stigmatizing those various dips, bits of conversation. So it's an interesting one. It is. And I think we're all learning, aren't we? And I, I mean, I know that. So my, one of my strategies, I mean, I, I'm not sure I've got the language for this and this might sound really clumsy. And if it does, yeah, I'm sorry. But, and then, you know, so you've almost done a caveat, you know, or is it okay if I ask X? And I think, guess the other bit is sometimes we don't say something because we're worried it's going to make it worse. And I remember we wrote, wrote a book about uh, people who'd experienced the death of a sibling a few years ago. My brother had died and so we were doing stories and someone said, people used to not ask me because they believed that it would make me upset. You know, the worst thing had happened. My brother had died. Them asking me how I was was not the thing that was going to upset me. It might make me cry in that moment. But it didn't actually matter. And I think it's those bits about feeling comfortable enough to sit when somebody gets upset and to not feel as though we have to rescue. People need to know that we care. We're humans. We need to know that we care. And, And some of the stuff about not wanting to offend is really important. You know, so if someone says, yeah, that's woke, great i'm really up for woke because woke means alert to the fact that there's inequality and injustice and it's you know almost your new political well it's your new political correctness if somebody doesn't quite have the language right or says something but does it with good intent then we have to also be in a position where we can acknowledge the good intent and call out the behavior so image finger we've got a zero tolerance policy And when we were first talking about that, we were really clear. That doesn't mean that if you say something or do something, that there is a, I can't think of the right word. It doesn't mean that there's going to be a sanction. It does mean that we're never going to walk on by. Yeah. And so there's something about making sure that we don't get mixed up here about not having the language around things we don't quite understand, but we need to understand better and haven't spoken about not avoiding things because we don't want to upset people when actually if they get upset, it's okay that they get upset and we might need to learn to sit with people being upset and then not saying things because of stigma. So there's probably a whole range of things, aren't there, which are, which are in there. And we, yeah, we just, I, I don't know. It's a journey of learning, journey of learning. It is. The most recent experience, I met an incredible chap who came up and said, I'll be following the Burnt Chef Project for a while. He said, I had to leave hospitality because I, um, due to prolonged periods of stress and working 80 hour weeks, he he had a episode of psychosis and I'd not ever met anyone before that had been hospitalized for psychosis. And I said to him, firstly, how are you? He said, I'm, I'm fully recovered. And I said, okay, I don't know much about, I've not ever met anyone. Do you mind if I ask you some questions? He said, yeah, go for it. I said, well, what did it look like? And he spoke about it. And by the time he finished, 
I just felt this wave of empathy. I said, look, you don't know me and I'm a complete stranger, but mind if I give you a hug? Because it sounds what you've been through is, is you know, it's been, it's been tough. He said, it is tough, but yeah, hug away. And this was a, you know, three Michelin star chef who now runs a charity, an incredible charity. And what surprised me about that was his openness to be able to talk quite frankly and quite openly about this just because I was asking in the correct way without, you know, and again, I didn't, I've never asked someone specifically, what was your episode of psychosis? Like, you know, that's not something that you would have in your vocabulary, but showing that I was interested in doing so because I was curious to learn more and to gain knowledge was, I think, the key thing for that. And equally, they might have said, actually, do you mind if we don't talk about it? Or they might have agreed to talk about it and said, don't hug. The fact that you were asking the question in order to get permission is also you know, a lesson isn't in this. It's, yeah, we mustn't necessarily assume that somebody will, but also not assume that they don't want to either. So how do you find ways of asking for permission to sort of move down through the route? So you did it. Lovely. Well, you know, again, only human, terrible at managing uh, certain elements of my own life, but it's it's always refreshing to be able to have conversations with people and do so for the right reasons. So to round this off, because I appreciate you're a very busy man and you've given me more than enough time of your time and, and information and knowledge and experience. What's next for Mental Health First Aid England? Well, today... Uh, which will obviously not be today when this is launched, but today has been My Whole Self uh, Day, which is uh, part of our annual day campaign for culture change. And we've published a new manager's toolkit, which is free to download from the website. Again, I'll give you the link to that. So that's our, our key newest bit. Our yeah, We deliver, you know, in many ways, lots of similarities around you know, consultancy and the training awareness training our focus will continue to be on supporting you know instructor members in order to be able to to do that and to make sure that the the new support and benefits which are part of that mental health first aider package you know are helping people to have those conversations that are helping people to do the job to change workplaces because i think the bit which i believe to be true about mental health is often the training whether it's mental health first aid training or whether it's a half day training course or champions training course or whatever lights a fire in people's belly and then they want to do more and then they want to learn more and then they want to understand more and then they want to make change in their businesses and so where I would really like to be is ensuring that we are both continuing people's learning opportunities but also connecting them to other places and spaces where people have expertise and learning and networks so yeah really exciting time you know our mission is to train one in 10 of the adult population this year with now one in 45 one in 44 of the adult population has been trained but our goal within that is ensuring that actually that depth and impact that people can make as a result of of the training and where yeah, where like organisations like yourselves working within hospitality and organisations working you know, in construction and in dentistry and other places is how do we just help? There are so many passionate people. How do we help connect them up? How do we help to make sure that we're all more than some of the parts? Well, that's perhaps conversation off air. It'd be great. I'm a judge at This Can Happen Awards which is just amazing in itself because it allows you to be able to connect with other industries and movers and shakers in this field. And there's so much to be learned and to benefit from, from just collaboration, just conversations in a room like, oh, right, okay, you're from the tech sector. What sort of things are you guys doing over there? And they'd be like, oh, well, actually, here's what we're doing. You're like, wow, I'd never even thought that was possible. So perhaps there's something from um, a sort of First Aid England point of view whereby you can host that space. I'd love to be a part of that and to represent hospitality from that point of view. Let's have that conversation. Done. See, these are great ideas. And what about yourself? Any eventing coming up? Any more eventing? Or is the, the horse recovering for a week or two? The eventing season is just about to start. I was out at the weekend and had a little try in the plan, but the first proper event is two weeks' time. So, yeah, it's uh, all good fun. So it goes through till October. Got everything mapped out for for the 18 weekends or something between now and October. Wow. And in terms of eventing, is are we talking like badminton 
eventing and that style. It's that style, but it's much littler. If you think about you know, Usain Bolt doing an egg and spoon race and then a 13-year-old doing an egg and spoon race, I'm the 13-year-old doing an egg and spoon race, not the Usain Bolt bit. Although badminton also do grassroots. So badminton, for those of you who don't know, is the most prestigious and horse trials event that there is in the world. But they do also host a amateurs grassroots event there, which I would love to qualify for and have got through to the regional championships, but not the nationals yet. So we shall see. But it would definitely be, as I say, in the baby egg and spoon race, not in the big one. Uh, so have you gone the whole, you haven't gone the whole hog yet then and got a, a big Winnebago and <laughs> one of these extendable cabins that I see at these event rates? No, I have a very old lorry which trundles along and every time you go through the MOT, I breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> That's definitely a hobby of love. I, uh, my father-in-law trains hurdlers, racehorses. I just, I mean, no offense to horsey people. I just, I can't understand it. They're big and terrifying. And I'm sure that everyone will argue against that who's involved in horses. But the thought of being even sat on one and, and investing lots of money and time is... Yeah, I'll stick to spreadsheets and <laughs> the odd skydive here and there, I think. There are lots of aches and pains that my body would not have if it wasn't for horses. But, you know, it's all good fun. It's all good fun. Simon, thank you ever so much. I very much look forward to continuing this conversation offline. And any final key takeaways for any of our listeners? Chris, just say thank you for your time. And I guess really it is, for me, this is about yeah, one conversation at a time, one step at a time, one lesson at a time. Um, and we've just got to keep on going. But yeah, it's all about being human. It's all about being human and trying our best. And there is no one silver bullet. So let's yeah, just keep on going. I guess is the key takeaway from this. Yeah, mental health is a social justice issue. It's an issue which we all need to keep learning we're at the start of something really important in workplaces and in our communities well said thank you very much i'll speak to you soon take care